Hello, my name's Ray Clark, broadcaster and author, and in this case, author in particular of Radio Caroline, the true story of the boat that rocked. Welcome to this special audio presentation for Heritage Open Days for Chelmsford. Uh, I would have liked to have attended, but uh, I should be out of the country. Normally I do a talk on Caroline, Britain's second longest established broadcaster, and uh, the talk comes complete with slides. It is a completely bonkers story. Uh, an unbelievable story that includes royalty, uh, high finance, battles with government, battles with nature, murder. There's a murder in there as well. Uh, and, and the fact that Radio Caroline continues to this very day. It is a pet topic of mine. It's, if you like, my mastermind topic. And that's what prompted me to write the book after I recorded two or three documentaries about the history of Caroline, or as much of the history of Caroline as anybody can come up with, because nobody but nobody can tell you the full story of Radio Caroline. Uh, a lot of the early instigators are no longer with us. And often two people would be in exactly the same position at the same time, but give a completely different story as to what went on and what happened. Uh, a few bits of background information. The whole reason for Radio Caroline was to promote commercial radio, to make money effectively. But to do that in Britain back in 1964, well, you couldn't. You, you couldn't go to the government who control broadcast licenses and say we'd like a license to broadcast and on top of that we'd like to add commercials to our output it just wasn't on there there was a, a government inquiry in 1961 62 into the need for commercial radio the pilkington inquiry and it was decided that there was absolutely no interest and no need for commercial radio in britain and this just a few years after the advent of commercial television and a similar problem had been found in other European countries. Denmark, with Radio Mercure, Radio Mercury, was the first offshore radio station to play popular programmes, popular music and commercials. And that started in the 50s off the Danish coast. Radio Nord followed off the Swedish coast and Radio Veronica, a veteran nautical radio station. And Veronica still plays a part of the national broadcast system in the Netherlands. So the reason that all of this took place on board a ship was because you had to be outside the, the, the government's ruling in Holland, in Sweden, in Denmark and obviously in Britain. It wasn't illegal to operate a commercial radio station, well at least up until 1967, as long as it was outside the territorial waters of the state. Uh, and even then it wasn't quite legal, it was a loophole. And that's how the likes of Radio Caroline came to be on the air and came to entertain millions and millions. So my book, uh, The True Story of the Boat That Rocked, uh, and available still, is, uh, is, is the guideline to, uh, to this monologue, I suppose we should call it. Now, when people think around the world of offshore radio, commercial radio, pirate radio, call it what you will, they think of Radio Caroline. But as I've hinted, it wasn't the first and there were many to follow and not just in Europe. Uh, radio Haraki broadcast off the New Zealand coast and the Voice of Peace broadcast for many years off the coast of Israel. But let's start with Caroline, but not if you see what I mean. Ronan O'Reilly, a young Irish-American, is the guy that's thought of when you, you think of Caroline. He was the man behind Radio Caroline. Without Ronan, it wouldn't have happened. He was a bit of a rogue, I think isn't too strong a word. Uh, he was good with money as long as it was somebody else's, certainly not his own, uh, and then it good at looking after somebody else's money and making it disappear. But even despite the fact that organisation and Caroline were two words that probably wouldn't go together, it was a huge success. And as I mentioned earlier, Caroline continues to this day. An Australian music publisher, Alan Crawford, had moved to London was working for the world's biggest music publishing company, Southern Music. But he had this idea of commercial radio, 
He also produced cover versions of popular tunes of the day and sold them via magazines such as Titbits and Rivale that were very, very popular back in the early 60s. He wanted a way to publicise his songs on his radio station. So Radio Atlanta was to be the radio station that he dreamed of, Project Atlanta. He went looking for money, basically, and found somebody like-minded, a South African theatrical director and producer, Kitty Black. The two of them formed a company, which in turn formed another company called Project Atlanta. And they went off looking for a ship. In fact, a ship that had already been used off the coast of Sweden, the Radio Nord ship, originally known as the Bonjour, later the Magda Maria, and eventually the Mi Amigo, very famous ship in Radio Caroline's history. But Alan Crawford and Kitty Black didn't have enough money. So they went looking again for further contacts. They found a guy called Major Oliver Smedley, very much involved with high finance in the city and a bit of a character. You could say dodgy? Others might not. But he was also involved in politics. Had we been talking about 2020 rather than 1962-63, Brexit would have come to mind, very much in the ideal of Britain should stand alone. Anyway, Smedley knew people with money. But before Alan Crawford had done a deal with Smedley, he'd come across a bit of a lad, Ronan O'Reilly, the man credited with starting Radio Caroline. He went to O'Reilly, who was involved in the music business in London, and said, I'm looking for money. Ah, said Ronan, my father has money. He might be interested in your project. Give me all the paperwork that shows we could legally start an offshore radio station. I'll take the paperwork to my father and perhaps come back with money. He didn't come back with the money for Crawford. What he did come back with was his own project, Radio Caroline. Beating Alan Crawford at his own game, Ronan O'Reilly found the money. Where did he find the money? Well, not his own family money. Uh, he went to the top, or effectively. One of those who he became acquainted with was a young guy called Ian Ross. His father had bucket loads of money. Jimmy Ross, he was known as, and another high flyer in the world of finance. Now, this Mr Ross knew other people with even more money, including John Sheffield, who owned a company called Norcross that back in the day made a habit of bailing out companies that were struggling a bit. The Jensen Car Company was one. Buxted Chicken was another. He had money. He also had a daughter who was married to Jocelyn Stevens, who owned Queen Magazine. But Jane Sheffield wife of Jocelyn Stevens, daughter of John Sheffield, was a lady-in-waiting to Princess Margaret. That's where the money came from, the money that enabled Radio Caroline to start. Cash was used to buy a ship, uh, a retired Danish ferry boat in Rotterdam. The ship was taken to Greenore, the port of Ronan O'Reilly's father. Yes, he owned a port in Ireland after making his fortune selling breeze blocks and Christmas trees. And, and, of course, the O'Reilly family, uh, very much part of the recent history of the island of Ireland. Ronan's grandfather was shot dead by the British Army in the 1916 Easter Uprising. So here was Ronan, a rebel, and now he had a cause to be a rebel. An offshore radio station that was just about to broadcast to England. Easter Saturday, 1964, Radio Caroline was on the air. Simon D and Christopher Moore were the first voices heard, and within a few days, half the country, it would seem, were listening to Radio Caroline on 199, your all-day music station. The programmes, from the ship, moored off the coast of Felixstowe. A few weeks later, along came Alan Crawford's Radio Atlanta. Yes, he got the money eventually and the ship that he'd been looking for for two or three years. But he'd been pipped at the post by Caroline. And whenever you think of offshore radio, Caroline is the name that comes up tops. After a few more weeks, the two of them, Radio Atlanta and Radio Caroline, realised, Crawford and O'Reilly, that they weren't making as much money as they could be by competing with each other. So a deal was done. The Atlanta ship, the smaller ship, Mi Amigo, would stay on the East Coast, mooring off Frinton-on-Sea, and the original ship, the Fredericia, the Caroline, now named, would go up north and anchor off Ramsey Bay, off the Isle of Man. 
and became Radio Caroline North. And from July the 3rd, 1964, Britain had a commercial radio network, Caroline North, Caroline South. Millions tuned in listening to the latest pop songs. At this time, Herman's Hermits, I'm Into Something Good, Roy Orbison, It's Over, The Beatles, A Hard Day's Night, just a selection of the songs that Caroline was playing. The BBC playing very few pop songs. Even Caroline in these days were playing songs from the shows and not quite classical music, but certainly pretty boring if you were to listen to the tapes now. So if they were that boring, then the BBC must have been even more boring at the time for Caroline to be the huge success that it was. And others followed. Screaming Lord Such took possession of the wartime forts, one of them at the Shivering Sands in the Thames Estuary. The fort's still there, in a bit of a sorry state nowadays, but the history they could tell. And Such started Radio Such, which turned in eventually to Radio City, owned by his manager, Reg Calvert. There were to be problems along the way with Reg Calvert and Major Oliver Smedley. Remember him? One of the guys involved with Project Atlanta. More on that in a moment or two. You see, I told you it was a bonkers story. It's uh, so complex that much of it will be left out in this shortened version of uh, a monologue, I suppose we could call it. Uh, I am Ray Clark. Where do we get to? Screaming Lord Such and his manager, Reg Calvert, with a radio station called Radio City, eventually in the Thames Estuary. Other stations came along. A Radio Invicta also broadcast from forts in the Thames Estuary. A little later, Radio Essex, uh, the country's first 24-hour-a-day local commercial radio station. And this is back in the 60s. But the biggest threat to Radio Caroline came at Christmas 1964 when American-backed Wonderful Radio London, Big L, turned up and broadcast much in the lines of the top 40 stations of America. And from day one, it was a huge success. So much so that Radio Caroline South, owned by Alan Crawford, Project Atlanta and Kitty Black and Major Oliver Smedley, were losing money. They had to sell out to Ronan O'Reilly and his company, Planet Productions, that were operating Radio Caroline North. So from late 1965, O'Reilly had both Caroline ships under his control and Project Atlanta were smarting, in particular Major Oliver Smedley. Remember the name. Into 66, it wasn't good for Caroline. Their ship in the south ended up on the beach in Frinton. This in a place where at the time you couldn't have a portable radio on the Greensward. They had a complete radio station after the anchor chain broke. Uh, the ship eventually got to Holland, was repaired and came back again, this time with an improved signal and an improved service as well. So Radio Caroline South now able to give Radio London a run for its money. And this was the start of the heyday of British pop music in many people's eyes and ears. Uh, wonderful Radio London, Radio Caroline South, Radio Caroline North, Radio City, Swinging Radio England, Britain Radio, Radio 390, Radio 270. A fabulous time to be growing up and listening to pop music. But it couldn't and wouldn't last. Radio City on the Shivering Sands Fort was struggling. It was making a bit of money, but was capable of making much more. Back to 1965, when Radio Caroline South, in effect Project Atlanta, was losing money, Major Oliver Smedley went to Ridge Calvert and said, if we put a transmitter onto your fort, could this now become the home of Radio Caroline South? And we'll take our ship, the Mi Amigo, up north to broadcast to another part of the UK. Well, the deal sounded good on paper, but it was never that good. Smedley and his group, Project Atlanta provided a new high-powered transmitter, which was anything but, uh, not helped by the fact that it was dropped into the Thames when it was being transferred from the tender boat to the fort. It was dragged out, but never worked properly. Now, Reg Calvert wanted out of pirate radio, and he'd got a deal struck with Radio London. They were going to start another radio station on the Shivering Sands Fort. Smedley got wind of this, his transmitter was on the fort. He claimed it was worth an awful lot more than it actually was. So he ordered a boarding party onto the Shivering Sands and silenced Radio City. Ridge Calvert, the owner of Radio City, understandably not impressed with this, went to have a word 
with Smedley at his home in Wendon Zambo near Saffron Walden. It resulted in the death of Reg Calvert, shot by Smedley. In a court case that surprised many, Smedley was cleared of any charge. It was self-defence, after being initially charged with murder and then that charge reduced to manslaughter. Calvert was dead, Smedley had got away with it, but this was to be a turning point in British offshore radio. Anthony Widgwood Ben, the Postmaster General of the day, understandably said you can't have pirates going around shooting each other. These stations will be closed down. And on August the 14th, 1967, the Marine Etc. Broadcasting Offences Act was introduced into the UK. Where half the country were listening to these offshore commercial radio stations and our constant supply of pop music was to be turned off just like that. With the exception of Radio Caroline, Caroline said, we're doing nothing wrong other than playing records on the radio. We will continue. And they did. Disc jockeys Johnny Walker and Robbie Dale continued to broadcast as Radio Caroline. Well, that was until March 1968 when the money ran out. And that was the end of Radio Caroline. Or so many people thought. So, an entire era of listening to pop music non-stop, 24 hours a day, on the radio, with new names. Kenny Everett, Tony Blackburn, Simon D, Johnny Walker, John Peel, all of them starting on the pirate radio stations, and now without a job. Well, for a few weeks, until the BBC were forced to establish a popular music service. On the 30th of September 1967, wonderful Radio 1 hit the airwaves. There was no need for Caroline, was there? You're listening to a special audio presentation for Heritage Open Days for Chelmsford. My name is Ray Clark. So we've gone through the 60s and that was the end of offshore radio, of Radio Caroline, so everybody thought. But 1972, the Caroline ships that had lay rusting in harbour in Amsterdam were bought up for auction. One, the original Caroline ship, was scrapped. But the other, completely uninhabitable and unseaworthy, the Mi Amigo, put to sea. And amazingly, surprisingly, Radio Caroline was heard again. There was no money, it was an unseaworthy ship, the equipment didn't work, but over the weeks and months and years, Caroline was rebuilt, like a phoenix from the ashes. And in 1974, was popular off the coast of Holland. But then the Dutch introduced a similar law to the one that the British had introduced in 1967. So Caroline came home to the UK and anchored 18 miles off the Essex coast, where nobody could see what was going on. But you could certainly hear the programmes of Radio Caroline, live from the radio ship Mi Amigo, the very rusty and aged radio ship Mi Amigo. 1980, and time caught up with the ship. She sank off the long sand in the Thames estuary. And that surely must be the end of Radio Caroline. August 1983 and Radio Caroline was back, this time with the strongest, best-built ship they'd ever had, the 1960 trawler Freya, later known as Ross Revenge, and a victim of the Cod Wars. She had held and still holds records for catching more fish than any other ship. And she was now redundant because Britain no longer had a deep-sea fleet, an ideal home for an offshore radio ship. Complete with a 300-foot-high radio mast, the highest structure ever put on a ship, Caroline was back with a bang and broadcast throughout the 80s. Well, until a few weeks after the hurricane of 1987 when that huge 300-foot-high mast came tumbling down. And then in 1989, the ship was raided by the Dutch. There were rumours that more offshore radio stations were just about to come on air. And the Dutch, understandably, didn't want to be put in a position that Britain was in in the 60s, with an outbreak of offshore radio ships. They raided the Radio Caroline ship, wrecking much of the equipment, taking all of the radio equipment. Fans of Caroline fought back and supplied Radio Caroline 
with replacement equipment. Caroline was back on the air, but the damage had been done. Eventually, in 1991, the most draconian of British laws was introduced. Had a ship off the coast been smuggling people or drugs? Well, there wasn't much the government could do about it. But broadcasting radio programmes and force could be used from the armed forces to silence the broadcasts. Eventually, it was nature that silenced the broadcasts as Ross Revenge ended up on the Goodwin Sands. And, surprisingly, miraculously, legend has it only two ships have ever survived grounding on the Goodwins. Ross Revenge, the home of Radio Caroline, one of them. No money, a wrecked ship, but it was still afloat. It was in Dover Harbour, where it had been salvaged by the Dover Harbour Board. Eventually, it would take ages and ages to tell you the full story, but fans of Caroline rallied round, money was raised, broadcasts were started with no listeners. But Caroline kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on. Ronan O'Reilly, the charismatic man behind Radio Caroline, died in 2020. But Caroline, now under the control of Caroline supporters, Caroline fans, continued taking step by step by step to get the station back into the limelight, where it certainly is now, with a full licence for 648 medium wave, broadcasting from a high-powered transmitter from Orford Ness, the former government secret facility and the former home of the BBC World Service Transmitters. In 60 years, Caroline has gone full circle. Many have to ask why Caroline wasn't given a licence in the first place. But it's not just old-fashioned AM that Caroline broadcasts on. State-of-the-art DAB, Caroline was one of the first stations to use internet radio and is now available with three regular services online around the world, on DAB and on medium wave. Check it out radiocaroline.co.uk So if anybody says Caroline, oh I used to listen to that years ago, you might like to surprise them by telling them it's still around and thriving and that is a very, very, very short version of the most complicated and crazy and unbelievable story in British broadcasting If you want more details, my book is available published by History Press, Radio Caroline the true story of the boat that rocked, you can buy a copy on Amazon, any good bookshop, or via the Radio Caroline webshop, radiocaroline.co.uk. If you're interested in seeing the talk, seeing the talk with slides, not just words, then contact me, rayradio100 at btinternet.com, or check out my website, rayradio.co.uk. Thank you for listening. And I hope I might have whetted your appetite to find out more about the amazing history of Radio Caroline. Britain's second longest established broadcaster, 60 years old, March 2024. And the ship anchored in the Blackwater estuary. Find out more about Radio Caroline. Thank you for listening. <laughs>